I want to talk to you this morning in a little different style than usual. The church and each local church is intended to be a community of love. Would you agree with that? And that's the challenge. And by the way, that's the miracle. Because Jesus is Jesus, he's able to bring us all together and we stick at some level. Because of Jesus' love for us. I love that new song we sang uh, uh, on love. That was good. Can we do that one again at the end, Deanna? Jesus loves me. And uh, that's a good deal. Because I don't know who you are or where you've come from or what your background is today, but it's amazing. It is a miracle. If it was me, I wouldn't. But uh, Jesus loves you. And uh, I say that tongue-in-cheek, obviously, because every one of us cross paths with people who go, oh, how can I love them? I love Doug's prayer this morning. God help us. God help us. But we are to be a community of prayerful love. By the way, you cannot love people unless you stay connected in love with God. So that's the reason prayer is so important. Many of you are involved in a small group, and I want to encourage you, thank you for getting involved in a small group, and just to give you a little coaching, if you will. For all of you that are in a small group, whether it's in, uh, here on campus, you gather during the week, or in somebody's home, we have a small group in our house on Sunday evenings. And it's quite an interesting group. We are definitely an eclectic group, are we not? Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's great diversity, and it's a good thing. When you gather together in two or three, by the way, a small group is small. I've always said that to the years. People go, well, we just don't have very many people in our small group. <laughs> small. Everybody say Small. Yeah, small. If you got two or three, that's small, okay? You don't, it's not 10, 12, or 15 as a sign of success. Hey, we got 15. So I'm just going to tell you, I'm giving a little coaching here for us. When we gather together in twos and threes, here's two things to do for every time you gather. How about that? One, always make sure everybody in the small group gets the opportunity to be asked, how are you doing? And when you say, how are you doing, it's not this passing in the uh, middle of the day kind of thing. How you doing? It's how are you doing? And then you pause and let people, uh, then they go, are you serious? And then you say, how are you doing? And then you let them speak. So everybody should have an opportunity to find out how they're doing. Make sense? The second thing is that everybody in a small group, when you gather in a small group, everybody should get prayed for, at least given the opportunity to pray for them individually. Now let me just give a little more coaching here for all of you that are in small groups, and that is when you have a gathering of small groups, be aware of who's in the small group, and don't put anybody on the spot. By that I mean you may have somebody in your small group, and they've never prayed in public. And I, through the years, and it happens all the time, through, not only for us, but so people get together in a small group, and Joe Stranger, or Joe Smith, or John Smith, if it be, uh, comes into your small group, and immediately somebody turns to them and said, would you lead us in prayer? He's going, I just showed up. I don't even know what you're talking about. So uh, when I say everybody be prayed for, it doesn't mean that you call publicly on everybody in your house, in the, in the small group to pray. Make sense? So I'm just doing a little coaching. Having said that, can I give you another little idea on being connected as a small group? Yes, I can. In Hebrews 3.13, it says to encourage one another once in a while. It actually says daily. And how many need encouragement daily? And the reason it says that, it says encourage one another daily so that you will not be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. How many know sin trips us up? So I need constant encouragement. And so my friend Scott Hubbard started about 104 days ago a little habit, a discipline among us as a small group that has caught on. I go, why didn't I think of this before? Now, most of you in this room have uh, cell phones. Am I right? And most of you have paid the extra price to have texting. Now, Pastor Ray, he's a Scrooge. He still doesn't pay for texting. But <laughs> Pastor Ray, I still send him texts. They just don't get through. So here's a great idea. So Scott Hubbard brought it up and started it over 100 days ago, and then 
we, and I have another small group I meet with on Wednesday nights, and we started this past Wednesday night, and so here's the assignment, because isn't it good to be connected daily? And, and I finally found a good use for the texting. And that is, in your small group, to everybody who has a cell phone with texting, put them in a group in your phone, and then every day you send each other a verse of scripture or a word of encouragement so that you can encourage one another how often? Daily. Daily. Now, if you're too busy to send a simple text of a verse or encouragement, then you're way too busy. So what you want to do is, in your small group, make a little group thing, and I got two groups, and uh, it gets crazy sometimes trying to keep track of them, but uh, I got two groups, so every day somebody sends through a text, everybody gets it, and then everybody can keep giving encouragement to each other. And it's a wonderful idea. Would you try it in your small group? so that you can stay connected. Now, I'm really off track already this morning, so it doesn't matter. I'm just teaching. So while I'm on this button of texting, could I just ask you to be Christ-like in your texting? And uh, now, present company excluded, but some people out there, they really uh, use and abuse texting and Facebook, and it's one of my things I've said before, but... Don't let any unwholesome texting come out of your hands. Don't let any unwholesome words come out of your hands. And people are starting to text me even now as I talk. And uh, (laughs) don't do that. Don't do that. Uh, So, uh, how many here are loved by Jesus? And how many love Jesus back? And how many then are called to love others because that's the second commandment, greatest commandment? And so when you use your Facebook and your text, don't use it as an audience to gripe, grumble, complain, or criticize other people. And if I catch you, I will condemn you in Jesus' name. No, that's the message today. Don't condemn. But uh, listen, we say things in texts and Facebook we would never say to their face. It is amazing. I go, What were they thinking? So let me do my usual guidelines. Boy, this was really off the map, but you needed to hear this. I did. So use texting, emails, and uh, Facebook for only a couple things. One is you can share information, and in case of Facebook, you can tell people how great it's going for you or uh, put the pictures of your dogs on there and say, isn't this cute? That's what we do. And... uh, (laughs) Just share information. And the other thing is share words of encouragement. But do not use it as a platform to be critical, complaining, or condemning of any other people, groups, places, or things. So uh, how many would be willing to do that? Say, I'm not going to use it for the bad stuff. I will use it for the good stuff. How many would say, yes, I will do that? That's good. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Greg Bowie. (laughs) See, that's the way it works. Uh, So our small group, I just got a text from our small group, and Greg just texted me and said, nice word, Pastor, I'm encouraged. So see, that's how it works. That's how this works. Now, it's, but I'm not kidding you. So do it, please, would you do it, because it's good for you. The church is not an organization you join. The church is a family where you belong. Now, some people are pretty critical of the church being a family, but I haven't talked to anybody who has their blood family that really, the thing's off the charts. You know, wow, our family is really great, and then we come here to a church family, and it's a mess. My point is, thank God he holds us together. We are a family, and we are family of families, and it's amazing. It's only by the love of God and His grace, and we stick it out together, but the church is a family where you belong. The Bible says you belong in God's household with every other believer, and the church is a home where you are loved, and I hope you experience the love of God even today as we gather, and the church is a hospital where you find healing for your soul and for your body. That being said, I want you to look at your notes, and we're in a series on first things first, and I hope you haven't gotten bored yet with uh, first things first. So 
I'm talking about seven things Jesus gave us as first things. You have them listed. And Pastor Peter talked about what we're doing together. Over 225 people have taken a copy of Draw the Circle and have committed in that taking of the book to be in prayer during this 40-day season of Lent leading up to Easter. I know we ran out of copies. We've, we've, we've sent out and got ordered copies. They've come. We've, we've given out over 225. So now I think we're out of copies. But is there anyone here that would like to have a copy that hasn't gotten one yet? And so Robin's are, oh, I'm sorry. I missed you, Eric. I'll get one for you. Robin, uh, you can have this one. I'm sorry it's been written in, but, uh, but that's all right. Oh, and uh, Ryan, let me have yours, but because he's not using it, I'll give it to somebody else. He stole it from me this morning. Oh, this is a fresh copy. It's not even been marked in. So I think Erica had her hand up. Am I right for somebody else? Oh, Rosa. I'm sorry, Rosa. Uh, Rosa, sorry. Uh, so uh, here, here we go. Aunt Raymond, go, go back there. You'll find somebody. Rosa. There it is. There's the connection. Eric and Rosa. An A can really mess you up. Yeah. God did not send his son to this world to condemn the world. He didn't send Jesus here to condemn you, and he didn't send Jesus here to condemn me. He sent Jesus here that we might be saved. Saved. I like what it says in the message on John 3.17, it says, God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. But Jesus came to help to put the world right again. And that's our assignment too. If Jesus didn't come to condemn people, then we shouldn't either. That's the sermon in a sentence. So, write this down. Here's some uh, words. They all start with letter C. First one is comparing. Comparing. Another one is complaining. Comparing, complaining. These aren't on your notes. This is bonus. Comparing, complaining, criticizing. Comparing, complaining, criticizing, condemning. What do those four words all have in common? They all destroy relationships. They are the cancers, the C's, the cancers of relationships. Comparing and complaining and criticizing, and ultimately they all land at condemning. And Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn, I came to save. So, First things first, how many want to uh, live by first things? First, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and you, he will give you everything you need. Um, the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. First, be reconciled with your family members. First, bind the strong man. First, clean the inside of the cup. First, day of the week, worship the king. And today... It says, Matthew 7, 5, I'll say this softly, hypocrite? <laughs> the Jesus words, this is in the middle of a famous sermon, and it says, hypocrite, that he wasn't talking to us, he was thinking of others. And uh, let me just pause again and say, you know, Jesus is Jesus, he's God. There's a lot of things Jesus can do that I can't do. Because for me to attempt to do it, well, Jesus did it, yes, and he can get away with it, but I can't. So, uh, hypocrite, uh, turn to the person next to you and say, I don't know who he's talking to. Go ahead, I don't know who he's talking to. Hypocrite. (laughs) Circle the word first. It's first in value, first in time, first in place. First, remove the plank from your own eye. And then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother or your sister's eye. So this isn't much of a plank, but it'll, it'll do. So uh, 
Dear uh, Elton Dozier made this uh, and these some 20 plus years ago, and I always look at them and I think of Elton. And so, uh, can you imagine trying to look at you like this? Now, that's a small plank, but you get the idea. So, if you look at other people and uh, you haven't removed the plank, how many know you're in trouble? So, the problem is, what's the plank and what's that got to do with it? So, first, uh, first, remove the plank from your own eye. How did Jesus know that they were hypocrites? I mean, he didn't say, if you are a hypocrite. He just said, you hypocrites. How did he know? He knew that they were hypocrites because they were judging, or let me put it another way, he's giving a sermon. It's the middle of a sermon, and Jesus is teaching. It's the most amazing sermon ever. It runs from Matthew 5 to the end of Matthew 7. It's this remarkable message, and here he's been progressing through this amazing message that must have took... Taken a lot of took, must have taken a lot of time. It was a long message. And here toward the end, where he's been teaching and building up, he comes to this part and he says, So uh, do not judge, for if you judge, you're guilty. Don't condemn other people. In the way that you judge others, you will be judged. The way you condemn others, you will be condemned. And so uh, he says, why do you judge your brother or your sister uh, and try to correct them when you're a mess yourself? So he says, uh, don't judge, hypocrite. Why did he know he was a hypocrite? Because they were judging other people. A hypocrite was, it is a, uh, it is a, a theatrical term. It means one who wears masks. It means one who is a pretender. It's one who decides to speak or act under a false part. Hypocrite. Because they were hypocrites if they continually judged. Over 20 years ago, there was a little old lady. I have no idea when she came and went necessarily, but she would sit back there about where my elder John was sitting by herself every day, and she would come. She was in the early 90s, and she had one of those, uh, and I say this because I'm judging, but she had one of those <laughs> hairdos where it's all pulled up and there's a nice tight bun here. And I always thought to myself, she's wearing her hair way too tight because it was affecting her thinking. <laughs> the reason I say that is because uh, whenever I would greet her afterwards, she would always talk to me about how, how I, she would say, how come you're not preaching against sin? And I, was, I said, I, I do. I mean, I'm talking about it all the time. I just don't go, you sinner, which is what she was looking for. And uh, how come you're not preaching about sin? And uh, do you know what her uh, attitude was? <clears throat> she was a judger. She was, uh, she was measuring everybody by, do you make them feel bad? So I want to just give you, I, I worked it out. Don't be surprised. It's just a simple little acrostic. It took me hours just to figure out the right words to make the word remove work. So R-E-M-O-V-E. So I had to work on that. So that's where I spent most of my time in the studies today. So how do you remove the plank from your own eye? Well, first of all, you remember the golden rule. You do remember the golden rule, right? You remember the golden rule. The golden rule. Therefore, in everything, treat people the same way you want them to treat you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. So the golden rule is, do to others before they do it to you. <laughs> now, there's truth to that. You got to get that, right? You know, do, it, do to others. Treat other people the way you want them to treat you. So remember the golden rule. Now, this was a remarkable teaching. It is the summary of an incredible insight from Jesus, the master teacher. And in, um, I was studying, and I I started looking yesterday particularly into various translations. And so uh, this is a New Living Translation. I was looking through translations, and I discovered that in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, there was a word missing in most of the translations. And it was the word therefore. 
It's because those who were translating the Bible were trying to disconnect and make this little verse 12 stand alone without any context. But verse 12 says, therefore, and so you have to understand what the therefore is therefore, and Pastor Ryan's been telling me all morning, we don't use the word therefore. So let me give you another translation. So then... Now then, because of this, because of this, because of this, so then, in everything, treat others the way you want them to treat you. For this sums up all the law and the prophets. So, this is the summary. In Matthew 7, verses 1 through 12, Jesus deals with the deadly way in which we try to manage or control those closest to us by blaming and condemning them and by forcing upon them our wonderful solutions for their problems. Shall I read that again? Therefore, so then, now then, in everything, do to others what you'd want them to do to you because this sums up all the law and the prophets. Remember uh, the first and greatest commandment, love the Lord your God, and the second is like it, and all the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. So this really goes like this. We've been talking about loving God, letting him love us first, loving him back, and so that brings us to this really mature message, and it says, treat other people, and it is the general principle that follows up Matthew 7, 1 through 11. So Matthew 7, 1 through 12 Follow me with this. Jesus deals with the deadly way in which we try to manage or control those closest to us by blaming and condemning them and by forcing upon them our wonderful solutions for their problems. Does that make sense? Now, how many here with no condemnation meant are guilty? How many here sometimes are trying to manage and control people and get them to do what you want them to do. And you'll blame them into it. You'll, uh, I, I have to caution myself because uh, how many, just, unless you're using it to have fun and tease, I just want to tell you, whenever you're using sarcasm, you're condemning. If you're just teasing, everybody knows you're teasing, but when you go to sarcasm, you're condemning because you're doing it with an intent to make your point and dig it in. You follow that? So even if you, if less, oh, I'm just teasing. It, yeah, it might be. Just keep it teasing. I was just kidding. I'm sarcastic. I'm just kidding. But if somebody is sarcastic and they, they're not kidding, they're condemning. They're saying, what do people mean when they're, uh, oh, let me see. So what do we do? We love people. We don't control people. We don't manipulate people. We expend re- respect to others that we naturally hope they would extend to us. And this is how love behaves. And Jesus points it out. No condemning, not forcing our wonderful things on them. Now, I've done that for years. I'm a pastor. I stand up. I'm trying to force. I've I've been studying all week, and I'm deep with Jesus, and I got the word in me, and I'm really brilliant, and you need to listen. (laughs) Now, all I can do is, and if I'm honest, is just lay it out there and say, if this helps you, if it go for it, if it doesn't, sorry. Here we go. So not forcing wonderful things upon them. And then thirdly, how do we love them? Simply by asking from them what we want from them. And then, on top of that, ask God for what we want. Let me say that again. We don't condemn people. We don't force on them our wonderful solutions. I've been in so many conversations, and sometimes I'm standing in the circle where somebody speaks up and shares what's concerned to them, what's hurting them, and immediately there's somebody in the circle that jumps in to say, well, you know, I've been through that already, and here's the answer to your problem. And they're sitting there going, I'm not interested in an answer. I'd just like somebody to listen. You know what I'm talking about? Like, boom, I got the answer. Let me give it to you. Push, push, push. Jesus said, don't force them. So remember the golden rule. How many have it memorized? How many know what the golden rule is? The most brilliant summary of teaching in the history of the planet. So then, therefore, in everything, say everything, Everything. do to others before they do it to you. (laughs) 
and this sums up. Now, that's pretty good. That's not bad. That's a pretty good line. But do to others as you'd like them to do to you, and this summarizes, this sums up the law and the prophets. Okay, so remove means remember the golden rule. E stands for eliminate the plank from your eye. Eliminate the plank from your eye. So, what is the plank in your eye? How do you know if you got a plank or not? How do you know if you got a plank in your eye? Planks are not blind spots. Planks are not the same. You have the same sin in your life as that person which you're trying to judge. That's not what it is. You can write it down. Here's what it is. The plank in our eye is when we condemn other people. Do not condemn or you'll be condemned. Do not judge or you will be judged. And the plank in our eye is when we judge other people and condemn them and say they are bad. Now, be honest, most of the time we're not trying necessarily, it's not intentional, it's unintentional, but many times the way we communicate is condemning. Just our attitude is condemning. Like, you stupid. <laughs> and we didn't say stupid, but we were thinking it. I mean, kind of. So, removing the plank is removing the attitude of judgment and condemnation. Judgment and condemnation. <clears throat> condemnation is, I, I don't know if it's on your notes or not, but here it is. Condemnation is letting people know that we disapprove of them and find them to be in the wrong. Condemnation is letting people know that we disapprove of them and we find them to be in the wrong. Here's a neat quote. Fault finding is like window washing. Fault finding is like window washing. All the dirt seems to be on the other side. My friend Zoe Caves, our... He and his family moved to Florida last year, and I still haven't forgiven him for that. <laughs> but he was a coach, football coach in Monta Vista for a number of years. And for a few years, I had the occasion to be the chaplain for the team. It, it was basically my way of being able to hang out with my son. And, uh, but I was grateful to be the chaplain. There was one game that... Uh, the offense, especially the offensive line, and Zoe was in charge of the offense, they were not doing a good job of blocking. And so um, it was halftime. Now, Zoe is gone. He's not here anymore. And he doesn't watch this on the Internet. And so don't pass this on to him. Because I... <laughs> but uh, it was uh, a, a regular... It was an amazing moment because... Uh, um, Zoe was pretty worked up because he couldn't get his quarterback protected and they were just coming through and just nailing the quarterback before he had a chance to hardly even hand off the ball. And so it's halftime and we're over here and the guys are kind of sitting there and the, the offensive line mostly is sitting right there in front of them and Zoe is right in their face. And he is ticked off. He said, now you've got to get in there and you've got to block and you better do it. And uh, one of the young men on the front said, well, Coach, they're, they're throwing too many guys at us. It's, I'm just, you just be, yeah, just, you got to get out there and block. And he did it three times. Finally, the young man got up and walked away. And, and Joe, Zoe was just, he was just railing on the guys. So uh, the next week, I went into Zoe's office. And I said, uh, Zoe, I, I got the picture. In sports, the coach has permission to condemn and yell and get in the face of all their players. I, I get that. That's a cultural thing. 
But I, I said, Zoe, if I felt that you were not doing something right, could I treat you the same way you did young guys on the, on the offensive line? Well, no. I said, well, why? Well, yeah. <laughs> no good answer. Are you following me? Now, now, some of you are very sports fanatics. Some of you have coached. You're going to come up and straighten me out later. You're going to condemn me. <laughs> and you're going to push your pearls on me. <laughs> but do to others as you would have them do to you. And no way would you... In fact, can I tell you another story? Sure I can. I'm talking. Time, <laughs> time is running. So uh, one of the coaches was going to make a little speech be before the game, and I happened to know the speech because I wrote it. And, um, and so I gave him the little speech, and then um, he was going to do it. And then I went up to him before the time, and I said, uh, could I ask you a question? He said, sure. I said, could I give you a little coaching on how to make the presentation with the speech? And he looked at me and said, Why? Now, let me connect the dots for you. He's a coach. He tells the young people how to play football. I'm a coach. I can tell people how to make a presentation. But he thought, what do I need your help for? And I thought to myself, why do the football team need your help? Remember, sarcasm is condemning. So... Um, Condemnation is letting people know that we disapprove of them and find them to be in the wrong. What exactly do we do when we condemn somebody? We really communicate that they are bad, and bad as a whole, and they should be rejected. We communicate that they're not acceptable, and we sentence them to exclusion because they're bad. Now, to be fair, we don't, we don't intend it most of the time, but it's something that happens because it's ingrained in us. So... What happens is we exclude people and we uh, put them outside. We exclude them. A few years ago, my, uh, one of our pastors got inspired by this whole theme of uh, judging and condemning and not condemning. And so, um, so if you go online, if you go to Amazon.com, you can order uh, the book Beyond the Pale by Pastor Jeff Herring. And uh, you can find it online. And two and a half years ago, Based on these passages, he got inspired and wrote a little book. And uh, this is the t-shirt that goes with it. And it says extra large, but it looks like a kid's extra large. But uh, beyond the pale means when we exclude people from the community because they don't measure up. So that's what beyond the pale means. And so check out our author's uh, book, Beyond the Pale. This is an advertisement. And there it is. And so here's a t-shirt for uh, Stuart Bowie. Would you like this, Stuart? So uh, I don't know why I thought of you, but you can have it. And by the way, it's Jeff Herring's. Oh, your dad got it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So how do we remove the plank? Remember the golden rule? Eliminate condemning. You're going to have to work on that because we do it so subtly and so easily. We put people down, put people down, and because we feel put down. And then M stands for minimize pearl pushing. Minimize pearl pushing. Jesus said, he was talking and he says, don't give to the dogs that which is holy and don't cast your pearls before the swine or they will trample them under feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Okay. Wow. Uh, I maybe should come back because this is so important. Um minimize pearl pushing. Now, here is Jesus says, don't judge, don't condemn through five verses. And then sixth verse comes in and he says, he says, don't throw, don't give to the dogs what is holy and don't cast your pearl before the swine. So that, in my mind, turns me loose to go around saying, which one of you are dogs? Which one of you are pigs? Because I don't want to work with you because you're a dog or you're a pig because it says, don't do this. That is not what Jesus meant. 
How can he tell you on one hand, don't judge, and on the other hand, you've got to determine that people are pigs and swines and dogs? You know, you, you dog. That's not what Jesus meant. What he meant was, we think we have all these pearls and that we're going to share them with people. In fact, we share them whether the person wants it or not. And so we push it on them and then we get ticked because they reject it. In fact, they don't, they don't digest it at all. And they, in fact, I'm from Iowa, just a little bit generation, one little step away from being born on the farm. And they have pigs in Iowa. I'm telling you, pigs. Man, do they stink. <laughs> but I can remember born in a little town, and once in a while you'd hear the story about some pig that turned on the farmer and took a bite out of him. So why would he say, don't give your pearls to the swine lest they turn and tear you to pieces? It's because you try to give people your pearls, and they're not ready for that. And they go, whoa. And because they can't get anything out of that, they just turn and take a bite out of you. So minimize your pearl pushing. We as parents are the worst. Because we're wise and our kids are stupid. <laughs> and they're young and they don't get it. And so if you'll only listen to me, then you're going to get it. And they go, I don't want to listen to you. You keep pushing your stuff on me. So minimize pearl pushing. Remember, it's ways that we try to manage or control people. From the book Boundaries in Marriage, page 24. Where there is control, this is marriage now, this is family, this is church. Where there is control or perception of control, there is not love. Love only exists where there is freedom. So every person in this room has the freedom to choose yes or no. And when we try to take that freedom away from people, then we become controllers and manipulative and try and get them to do what we want them to do. And God's paid a terrible price to give us the freedom to choose. And that goes for, how many know you can't control your 12-year-old? We always get it backwards. When your parents, when you're, the kids are two or three, we put them in charge and then when they get older, we try to get them controlled. Instead of controlling them at the early age, and no, we can't control them now, but we still try. And we push our wisdom on them and push our pearls on them. So minimize pearl pushing. Oh, my goodness, that's rich. Well, if we can't push our pearls and we can't condemn, what can we do? Love. And how do we love? We obey the rule of the kingdom. And here's what Jesus said. Ask. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you in this room, if your son asks for bread, would give him a stone? Which of you in this room, if your son asked for a fish, would give him a snake? I mean, think about it. Now, uh, we think this is all about prayer. Therefore, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up. So, I've mentioned this before. It's one of the most, and I'm pushing my pearl right here. But when you deal with other people, be they your family or friends or that nasty employer or employee, when you desire something from them, simply ask them with an open hand. Would you be willing to do this? Would you help me with this? Would you pass the potatoes, please? Get those potatoes down here. Would you be willing? By the way, you do it with... Uh, you know the people that we're the least civil with, the, the people we're least loving with? Who is it? Our family? I mean, I get around you, I'm sweet to you because I'm concerned what you think about me. But you get me home and I'm nasty <laughs> because we're family and this, we just want to be honest and I just want to be up front and I want to be mean and not loving. Are you following me? 
in every relationship, be it whoever, my wife, my kids, my friends, the key is what? Ask. Don't demand. Don't tell people what they got to do. Ask them. Now, here's the, here's the key to whether you got it down really good or not, and that is, do you have the power within you to let them say no? Would you please do this? No. Well, you better do it now then. <laughs> so, even if it's managing a store or wherever you are, the key is ask because it respects the dignity of every person. And they, before God, have the freedom to choose. Get it? Does that make sense? So obey the rule of the kingdom, and that is ask. So per- turn the person next to you and say, the rule of the kingdom is to always ask. So, oh my goodness, we covered a lot of ground today. R-E-M-O-V, voice your request to the Father. Don't, this isn't, remember it's the context. Therefore, so now do to others, and that's the summary. Now we get to ask the Father. Voice your request to the Father. So if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in the heavens, give good things to those who ask him? Friends? Take it seriously and practice asking. Improve your asker. In these days, as we lead up to Easter, uh, read a chapter, encourage yourself, give a little in your spirit, and just ask. Say, God, I'm not sure what I should ask for, but would you? Would you help me? Would you do this? Would you help this? Would you take them out because they're bad? Anyway, whatever you would like to ask. So ask. Ask. So uh, yesterday... The uh, day 16 was uh, the prayer, surprise me, Lord. So this week, you're asked one thing with everything else is I want to encourage you. How many would be willing to every day say, Heavenly Father, would you just surprise me? Would you just surprise me? How many would be willing to do that? Did you notice I asked? So how many would be willing to do that? And so will you do it? Will you do it? Say, Lord, don't know what it's all about, but would you surprise me? All right, how many here, Doug prayed about it earlier, how many here have been hurt by other people? How many here are still struggling to forgive those other people? So what's the key? Ask the Father for help. You know, Lord, it says, uh, I must forgive them so that you'll forgive me, and then I go, "Mm, so I forgive them. I can't do it. I say, I will forgive them now. Oh, God, give me the grace. Give me help that I would forgive them. So I ask God for help. I ask God for help. Now, there are some people that on a regular basis come to my mind. I wish they were all the people I love, but usually it's the people that have hurt me. And they, at the most odd times, they come to mind. I'm driving along. <laughs> Man, would I like to sit down with them. I'm going to tell them a thing or two. (laughs) Do you know when you condemn somebody, the natural reaction is they will condemn you back? Because it's a hard thing not to do. Judge, don't judge, because you'll be judged back. You'll be judged back. So voice your request to the Father, and then the last point is exhaust the love of the Father. Exhaust the love of the Father. You say, well, you can't do that. That's the idea. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So if we're going to live... Without the plank in our eye, we've got to live loved by God so that we can be loving to other people. And so, it says in Ephesians chapter 3, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, do you know some of you, now some of you don't care yet, it's not that far down the road, but some of you have been so condemned, you have been so abused. You have been so rejected. The pain is just deep, deep, deep. 
I'm just telling you, the only way for us to overcome is to live and experience the love of the Father. I pray that from His glorious unlimited resources, God will empower you with inner strength through His Spirit. Then Christ will make His home in your hearts as you trust in Him. Then Christ will make His home in your hearts as you trust in Him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. Keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide and long and high and deep His love is. And may you experience the love of Christ though it is too great to understand fully, and then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. What a prayer. Would you stand with me? And so, I want us to sing that song again. I thought that was a great song. How many liked that song earlier? He loves me. He loves me. Now, some of you have really tested to the max God's love. I mean, you've really gone over the edge. But here's my request to you. Uh, everybody turn to the person next to you and said, God really loves you. Go ahead. Uh, Alvaro and Annette, would you be sure and see me right afterwards? It's good. It's all good. What I was thinking of is uh, press the uh, envelope in your daily living and walking with Jesus. You know, I, I, I recognize it in my methodology. I regularly ask you to turn and talk to somebody. And I do it to kind of take the edge off of, because we sit here and we get religious. And then you got to go out and live the other 166 hours of the week. And very little sometimes does Jesus come to the center where we speak kind words or loving words or put it out there. I know people make fun of me because when I text, almost every time I text, it's Dear Peter. And it's a sign of respect. It's a sign of honor. Uh, because uh, and it's a sign that we are together in Christ. So the reason I have you turn and so I, I see to yeah, God loves you. And what's really amazing is that some of you are sitting next to family members when you say that. <laughs> you know, uh, last week, last week, some of you, before you got here, had already been fighting and condemning each other before you arrived. Now, what? It's because we got up. If you wake up, you're going to have conflicts. Because welcome to this life. Now, there'll be a day when we don't have conflicts. It says that Jesus will send the angels and they'll remove everything that causes sin and pain and evil. But we still live in a broken world and we're part of the brokenness. So we need to live in God's love and then we need to do our best to keep bringing God's love to the center of every relationship. Does that make sense? And so it's even in the little things as you go through the day, instead of just being, keep intentionally. We are not a part of a religion called Christianity. We're part of a family in which Jesus is our big brother and God is our heavenly father. And it is a family that we're part of. And if we then, as family who is loved by God would love each other, then the world definitely will be attracted to us. And I, I don't say that as I'm so proud of and grateful for this church family. And by the way, we're the best church in town. <laughs> Not. We're a church in town and you're my favorite. But God's got children all over the place. So, 
uh, here's what I wanted to do as we begin to sing this wonderful new song is uh, I wanted to invite everybody in the house that you need to exhaust the Father's love a little bit because you feel really put down, condemned, you've been rejected. And by the way, if I go too extreme, people go, I'm not going because he's not talking, about, that's too far out. But you need to say, and by the way, I'm already down here, to experience the love of the Father that will not ever figure out how deep it is and great it is. But we can't do this without living in his love. So the minute we begin to sing this wonderful song, I invite you to say, you know, I really need to live more in his love so that I get away from all the condemnation, judgment, and shame, all the stuff, and I need to exhaust the Father's love because I can't. I need to experience it in Christ. You come the minute we begin to sing and we'll have a prayer together. I'm gonna lead us in a prayer, but all of you in the room, whether you came for or not, would you ask the Father to reveal his love to you through his Son in a greater way? Maybe just within your own spirit talking to God, but maybe verbalizing it out loud. But as I pray, I want you to ask the Father that you might experience the greatness of his love. It's the only way we go forward. It's because of his love for us. Our Father in the heavens, if we as frail and broken human beings know how to give good gifts to our children who ask us how much more will our Father in the heavens, our loving Heavenly Father give good things to us who ask. So in this morning, we ask you in the name of Jesus that we'd experience not just be aware of, not just know about, but we would know your love in our lives. Through the name of Jesus and by the presence of your Holy Spirit. Forgive us for being so quick to judge and compare and criticize and condemn other people. Forgive us for trying to straighten other people out and pushing our pearls on them. Would you help us to live love then? we might love you more fully and we might love others as we love ourselves. May you, Holy Spirit, make us mindful, be with us as we even walk through this week, 166 hours forward, that we don't just go it alone, but that you are with us and you are for us. And that now in Christ Jesus, therefore, there is no condemnation no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. I thank you so much for this fellowship. I thank you for the, this church family. I thank you for all our friends and guests that have gathered on this Daylight Savings Time Sunday. I thank you for their faith in you and faithfulness. And may the glory of the Lord shine upon them and watch over them, each, each one, each family. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining with us today in our streaming of our service and our message. We're grateful that you joined with us. And if we can serve in any way, we'd be glad to do that. Just check out our website. That'll get you connected in any way that you might like to. And uh, that is greenvalleychurch.net. And we wish you the best and know that you really do matter to God. Have a great day.